You've heard me talk many times over the years about the importance of getting inside the mind of a predator. Well, now in a very special episode, we're going to get inside the mind of a man who spent 50 years getting inside the minds of predators. Ken Lanning, an FBI veteran who till this day still works in the field of trying to find out why adults sexually attack children. What he has to say is something you need to hear. When I first started doing the predator investigations nearly 20 years ago, I went to the FBI to ask for an interview to get some behavioral insight into the mind of a predator, a pedophile, a criminal who seeks children online. And the FBI referred me to one of their former special agents, Ken Lanning, who is expert in the field. And we did an interview nearly 20 years ago, and he took me inside as best as he could the mind of a predator. And so I wanted to check back with Ken Lanning 20 years later and talk about what's happened with the explosion of online social media platforms, the mind of a predator, a pedophile, and get his take on the very latest and help you to protect your children online. Ken Lanning, thanks for being with me. How are you? Pretty good. It's a pleasure to be here. Over the last 18, 19, 20 years since we first started talking about this, the social media platform landscape has changed dramatically. There's been an explosion in the number of social media platforms upon which adults can reach out to children. That has made this all the more challenging, I would imagine. Yes, as far as I know, and what I said back then, and what I've said you know, up until now, is there's three areas that investigators and law enforcement, and I guess the public needs to understand, they need to understand in dealing with these types of cases, they need to understand the technology involved to some degree, they need to understand the laws that apply and don't apply. And the third thing is they need to have some understanding of the behavior involved. And what I focused on is the behavior. I recognized very quickly that the technology was changing rapidly. And I think of the three, the laws keep being revised, the technology keeps changing the fastest, but what I, I don't think changes too much is the behavior, the thing that motivates these people to do this. So fortunately for me, that's kind of a constant that I have some insight to because I've been studying the behavioral aspects of the sexual victimization of children for 50 years. And I guess that's the important thing to remember is that while the technology continues to evolve, the behavior of the predator, the pedophile, has stayed consistent throughout the decades. I mean, you know pretty much who these guys are. And I guess get asked all the time, you know, who, who, who are these guys? And the reality is, while they share some characteristics, they, they do come from all walks of life. But how would you best characterize the guy who takes part in this sort of grooming? Well, what I try to do is not to be so precise to say that they're this or that, but to look at broader categories. I would look for categories of offenders. And the three broad categories that I saw getting involved in these cases, what I call situational offenders. Individuals for situational reasons might get involved in this. Also, what complicates these cases, particularly the proactive investigations, is that law enforcement is usually indicating that they are teenagers. They're not getting online and saying, I'm three-year-old Mary or four-year-old Johnny. In the old days, when I first began in 1973, looking at this, we would talk to child molesters as if they were all strangers, dirty old men in wrinkled raincoats, that kind of thing. And then the field began to evolve and change and have greater insights into the different types of offenders. And then all of a sudden, one of the words that began to be used that wasn't used in the old days was the word pedophile or pedophile, depending on how you choose to pronounce it. But from a diagnostic point of view, pedophilia involves a sexual preference for prepubescent children. And from a 
diagnostic point of view, it applies primarily to individuals who are involved with children who are prepubescent, let's say under 12. And so in a lot of these cases, particularly the proactive cases, law enforcement was indicating that they were 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years of age. And that became, as the proactive investigations began to spread, became a, an important aspect of how you would justify what age you claim to be. Another way around that was to be to claim to be an adult who had access to younger children. I'm 42, but I know where there are children who are three or four or five, and they would talk about that type of situation. So once you start to talk about adolescent victims, the whole dynamics begin to change. The number of men, or maybe even a certain amount of women, that might be sexually interested in a pubescent teenager is much larger than those who might be interested in a prepubescent six or seven year old. It's a large group of people. And so a lot of these people go online and some of them are what I call situational offenders who are taking advantage. So some of them are opportunistic. Some of them are just morally indiscriminate. Some people call them psychopaths, sociopaths, people who don't have really much of a conscience and do what they ever feel like doing. And then some of them in the pornography field got back in this to make money. So you had people who were kind of profiteers motivated by money. But those who were trying to meet children fall into, most of them seem to fall into the other category of what I call preferential offenders. And these are individuals who have specific preferences. Now, the most obvious one, as people use the term pedophile, they're usually not using it in the diagnostic way. Most people, if you say, what's a pedophile? their response would be, it's a fancy word for a child molester. You know, regular people call them child molesters, but I've looked at this, I've studied this. We call them pedophiles, pedophiles, whatever they want to pronounce it. And they think of these individuals who have a preference for children. But technically speaking, in a narrow point of view, would be a preference for prepubescent children. Some have a preference for teenagers. Some people call them hebophiles. In other words, that just confuse people and so on. And then you have other people who have more diverse preferences, what psychiatry calls the paraphilias. They have interest in all kinds of strange type behaviors that many people don't even think of as being sexual in nature. And some of those things they may act out with children or teenagers because the teenagers are not gonna maybe be as offended or repulsed by it and so on and so forth. So you have those, and then you have an interesting category that's I think is very important to this whole issue of use of this technology is what I refer to as latent offenders. These offenders who had these urges, they had these fantasies, but maybe for a variety of reasons, they were able to keep them under control. But then you start to go online and you start to communicate with people and something happens that's very important. It's actually, to me, is the most significant part of the use of the technology but it's the part that's not illegal. And that is they go online, they start to communicate, they exchange information with a wide variety of people, including potential victims, just because it validates their behavior. It tells them that they're not evil, disgusting people, and there's a lot of us out here and we're doing this and we're not weird, evil perverts and so on. And so all of a sudden your inhibitions uh, that controlled your behavior uh, begin to become weakened and lessened, becomes easier and easier to do it. Then the third category is kind of miscellaneous others, including, <laughs> interesting, I'll just mention, some people in the media who decided that they could do this. They would go online and start swapping and trading pornography, talking to these individuals. And there's some questions about that. Some of these people were pranksters. Some of these people were the kind of people who wanted to mess with these people and didn't like them. And they thought they were almost like vigilantes and so on. And then you had, and that falls under the category of what I used to call overzealous civilians who decided they were gonna make it their life's work to combat this evil problem. And a lot of times they get themselves in a lot of trouble if they don't know what they're doing. This alleged predator comes to meet with a 15 year old girl. When I interview him, he reveals shocking details about his past. How many times have you had sex with underage girls? Is this the one, um, the one that was in trouble there? And do you think you were fairly treated in that case? Well, I definitely, I mean, I did have a lawyer which was helped a lot, but I, um, I also, um, I mean, I affected her life a lot. So it's, you know, that was kind of, it was just what, 
does what I deserved at the time, you know. How old was the girl you had sex with? She was 15. She was 15. Yes. And how old were you? I was 18. 18. I didn't think there was anything wrong with that at the time, because the three year, um, the three year difference. Right. Let's talk about the opportunistic guys first. You've got a guy who's 22, 23 years old, and he's trying to hook up with a 12, 13, or 14 year old. In his mind, he's thinking this is a Romeo and Juliet situation. But in reality, this guy is just as harmful to this child as somebody who's 32, 42, or 52, right? Absolutely. The, the point is that for some of these individuals, for the morally indiscriminate, they really have their own conscience. Some people say they don't have a conscience. But in my work, they do have a conscience, just happens to be their own. It doesn't match up with society's conscience. And so they think that there's nothing wrong with this. But a lot of people struggle with it. And they look themselves in the mirror and say, am I a good guy? Am I somebody who cares about, loves children? Or am I some kind of evil, disgusting pervert that hurts children? And so they're having this struggle. And so they go online and they see the number of people doing it. I think a lot of these people their inhibitions became reduced as a result of this activity. And they convinced themselves that what they were doing was not too bad, but what they do can be exploitive. I first met 45-year-old Todd Baraka while working with Ghost, the Genesee Human Oppression Strike Team, when he showed up in one of our undercover stings. The person you were here to meet said they were 15. You acknowledged that. No, I did not. Yeah, you did. No, I did not. John, I have seen the transcripts. Just... We see so many times uh, in our recent investigations in the last several months, uh, a professional will show up. We've had a guy, for instance, who is a law enforcement officer, and he shows up to uh, have a sexual liaison with a teenage boy. and. He pleads guilty and the case is about to go away until they finish going through his phone where they find hundreds of images of child pornography. And here's a guy who's in law enforcement, who swore to protect people, and he's got this secret activity going on in his background. What's the profile of somebody like that? It's a very troubling issue for me because when I was actively involved in the FBI and I was putting people together and doing seminars and training and working these cases, I got to know, particularly in the early days, most of the officers who were involved in these kind of investigations. And as the years went by, several of them turned out to be offenders themselves who were breaking the law and doing this. And a lot of it, when you say, what is the profile? In a lot of cases, these individuals somehow convinced themselves that what they're doing is different. There's these guys that I'm investigating, and these are bad guys. These are guys who hurt children. What I'm doing is I'm helping and reaching out to these troubled kids, homeless kids, runaway kids, kids from dysfunctional homes, and I'm trying to help these kids. But we have to understand, and I deal with this all the time in the cases involving those who access children through youth-serving organizations, that these guys are nice guys. And a lot of people don't like it when you call them nice guys. They say, oh, they're only pretending to be nice. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. I said, well, some of them are that. But some of these guys appear to be nice guys because they are nice guys. And, and later on, I'll talk a little bit, if I have time, about the whole use of the word predator and the problems I have with the word predator. It conjures up a certain image of disguised evil, that you're setting a trap and you're going to spring the trap. When a lot of these guys come across as nice guys, you start to communicate with these kids. Now, some of the communications go very fast. In my experience, cases involving boy victims usually move faster than those involving girl victims. There's usually a little bit more grooming with the girls. But a lot of these guys are nice guys, and they'll tell these kids what they want to hear, and they'll tell them how attractive they are, and they provide a social outlet for a lot of what they what they're looking for. So a lot of these guys, including professional people, there's nothing to say that if you have this sexual interest in children, you have to be some slime ball who just lurks around the corner. Some of these people can be doctors, lawyers, police officers, FBI agents, all kinds of people. So he wants her to refer to him as daddy. Absolutely. This alleged predator gets a little too handsy with our decoy. And for this doctor... You talked about sex in the chat with her. No, I, I, I might have, but that was... Um, might have. I'll be the one delivering some bad news. Well, doctor, there's something you need to know. 
I'm Chris Hansen, and I do stories on men who try to meet children for sex. We had uh, recently uh, an investigation where a 61-year-old doctor came for a teenage girl. Uh, after chatting with her on and off throughout his day, as he saw 18 patients, he even took a break to photograph his genitals and send it to the decoy posing as the girl, all the time operating, presumably in a normal fashion, seeing patients in his family practice as a medical doctor. How does a guy operate on two levels like this? He, he's going through his work day as a respected physician, and at the same time, he's grooming a child for sex and going to drive over there in his Range Rover, well-dressed, uh, with Oreo cookies and wine to rape a child, essentially. Well, the word that I think most people use, they learn to compartmentalize their, their life. And for a lot of these individuals, they're doing productive things. They work at a job, a doctor, a professional, or a mechanic, whatever they are. And then they have this other part of their life, this sexual part of their life. They have essentially a sexual problem. And this is where some of these guys, when arrested, begin to use various defenses in these cases. Some, some call it the fantasy defense, or some people call it internet addiction syndrome, that somehow they became addicted to this. They went online and started to see these kind of images, engage in this behavior, and they lost control. They're not responsible. They have diminished capacity, and they became addicted to it. But basically, they can compartmentalize their life. They can decide they do all these good things. Now, interestingly enough, some of these offenders, the good things that they're doing involve working with children. They work with children, they're volunteers, they're big brothers, they're Boy Scout leaders, and so on. And so they do that. And everybody thinks that the only reason they were doing that is because they wanted access to children. And that certainly is possible, and it's there. But it doesn't preclude the possibility that some of these kids are doing that. Some of these offenders are doing that to help them rationalize. They look themselves in the mirror and the person that they're trying to convince that they're not evil, disgusting perverts is essentially themselves. They want to believe that they're good people and that they care about people. But maybe the most important message I would have is I certainly support the efforts of law enforcement. These people are breaking the law. They're committing serious crimes. They can do great damage. So we have to look at it. But we have to be careful that we just don't fall into simplistic stereotypes and decide that all these guys are this or that or the other thing. You need to look at the facts of the case and what does the evidence support. And that's why I've always been a big advocate for 40 years of executing search warrants on the guy's home and office and other place to find out what kind of a collection he has, what kind of paraphernalia does he have, what kind of images does he have. What kind of fantasy writings does he have? And a lot of that gives you a good insight into where he fits in all of this. Most important thing is that he break the law. But if you want to have a better understanding or try to defeat some of these defenses, you can look at all of this stuff and see what it indicates. What's your plan today? I uh, talked to her about her life. I told her I was showing up to give her money so she didn't have to do this for a day. Why do you think it's different than that? Because I hear this story all the time. OK, sure. And it's bull You have heard, I'm sure, as I have in these investigations, virtually every potential <laughs> excuse. Right. Uh, I was just here to, to tell the girl that she was doing wrong and I was going to counsel her is, is one that I've heard over and over and over again. It's a, it's a sense of denial, I suppose. Well, I mean, it's a sense of denial, but the reason that they're able to come up with them so quickly because it's part of their own rationalization. And so they come up with this because that's what they want to believe that they're doing. One of the questions I've been asked many, many times is, do these guys really believe this? Or is it just something that they're saying? And I said, I don't know. I think on some level, they know it's a load of nonsense, but they've been saying it so long and they so desperately want to believe it. So a lot of these guys, particularly those who are professionals and have some structure in their life and are well-educated, have a need to believe that what they're doing is not bad. We had a recent case where a 54-year-old man traveled from Chicago to Dayton, Ohio, to have sex with a teenage girl, brought with him a, a backpack in which he had, you know, condoms, lubricant, spermicide, Plan B pills. And he had children of his own 
And it turns out, Ken, that he admitted to me that he had done this on at least two other occasions with two other teenage girls. And he got into detail about it. And I'm shaking my head talking to this guy, thinking, you know this is wrong. You admitted having sex with other underage girls. Mm -hmm. And he's wearing a necklace, a friendship necklace, that one of the previous victims had given him because he had been able to groom her into a relationship that she thought was somehow emotionally significant. And had this guy not gotten caught in the sting, he would, I, I have to believe, still be out there doing this. And if he admits to two in the past, I, I got to believe there's more. Am I wrong here? No, you're not wrong. And because what I have said for many, many years and doing the training that I did is sex offenders generally will only admit to two things. They'll admit to that which you know or they think you know. So in your case, you have a certain amount of evidence. And as you're doing the interview with him, you're presenting it. So he realizes that you know this. There's no really sense anymore in denying it. So that's one thing they'll admit is that which law enforcement knows or he thinks they know. And the other thing they'll admit to is that which they can rationalize. And the problem is they can rationalize almost anything. Now, one very important thing with an offender like this is if you have an offender who has gone to great lengths to rationalize and justify his behavior, and he has his own children, it's gonna be very hard for him to maintain that belief that he's not a bad person if he does not do to his own children what he does to these other children. And that's shocking to me, too, because, you know, we've seen this over and over and over again, where a guy gets arrested in, in one of our stings who, who has children of his own and sometimes adopted children. And it raises very disturbing questions in my mind and in the minds of, of the law enforcement investigators who are also involved here. The important thing is he broke the law. You got him dead to rights. He got the evidence. You can convict him. He's going to plead guilty and so on and so forth. But if you want to find out how far to take this, I mean, how many victims could a 60-year-old man have who's developed this ability to groom and seduce kids, whether it's online or in person or both? And so you need to consider that and to think about how many other victims there might be. This is something you're wanting to do. She'll do whatever. She'll be great. Yeah, I just do what I'm told. You do? Mm -hmm. Daddy's girl, huh? Absolutely. She That's is. a wonderful she is. We want to make sure she's safe. She is. You've done this before. I mean, yeah. Make her feel better. Like, I mean, that, that's what makes her feel better. Like, this is. Yeah, I mean, I've been with. Sometimes I just need to be like, talk through it, you know? Well, yeah. We're going to be very slow, very easy, and we're going to catch a lot, play a lot. You've done a great job with her. I yeah. can tell. What do you mean? You get down? You brought her up right. What do you mean? Like just, just oh, sexually. Yeah. You mean with the mm -hmm. with dad helping her through this? Stuff? Absolutely. You think that's? I think that's very important. That think, dad helps her sexually. I think that? I think that parents should be more involved in their kids' sexual activities. Yeah. Personally. One of the things we're seeing now in, in the more recent uh, sting operations is, is guys who have this fantasy of having sex with a child and involving either the mother or the father. We had a guy who was 70 years old, came from Indiana to Ohio, and he walks into the house and the deputy is pretending to be a 13-year-old girl and the detective is pretending to be her dad. And you watch this scene play out, Ken, and he's ogling the girl as he brings her a milkshake. And he's having the discussion with the detective posing as the father saying, you know, it's good you're teaching your 13 year old girl about sex because guys her age don't know how to do it. And and he, 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 you watch this thing play out in real time. And I've seen a lot of stuff, you know, not a lot, you know, rocks me, but watching this was so profoundly disturbing because you know, if this wasn't a sting, if it was happening in real life, this 70-year-old guy would be having sex with this 13-year-old girl and then asking the father to do it and watch. I mean, we're, it, this, is, this is what people don't understand. We can understand to some extent kind of so-called quote-unquote regular criminals 
who sometimes engage in patterns of behavior that for as long as I've been alive, from watching Dragnet when I was a little kid, are called MO, modus operandi. So they have a certain pattern of behavior that helps them to get away with their crime. But not all, but many, many sex offenders have another pattern of behavior. It's a pattern of behavior they engaged in based on a need, not because it works, not because it helps them to get away with crime, but because they need to do it this way in order to be aroused and gratified. It's fantasy driven behavior. This man who's doing what you just described has probably fantasized about this a thousand times or more and imagined it in many different ways in his fantasies. And so it's fantasy driven behavior and they're trying to turn their fantasy into reality but fantasy, reality hardly ever lives up to fantasy. But many people have these kind of fantasies. They think about them, they rationalize them, and it becomes a driving influence in their life. The other thing that's interesting about it that's outside my area of expertise is the fact that for regular sex drive, for like morally indiscriminate offenders, as they get older, their sex drive begins to weaken and lessen. But a lot of the preferential offenders, it doesn't seem to happen. They may have difficulties in sexual performance, but these urges that they have seem to last into the 60s and 70s. I know for a fact that, you know, these guys don't fit one profile and you know uh, this way better than I do. And I also know that in our society, we want one size fits all answers. <laughs> how to punish these guys and how to deter this behavior. But how do we globally as a society come to grips with this in terms of punishment, deterrence, therapy, but what are we not doing in society that we should be doing to deter this kind of behavior and to punish people who engage in it? Well, when do, when do we get to the hard question? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that's tremendously difficult because what I have observed in 50 years of dealing with this is Americans tend to love to talk about sex in a joking kind of way, using analogies. When I was a teenage boy, you went out on a date, you would describe what you had done as getting to first base or second base or third base. We tell jokes about it and so on. But not many teenage boys or even college boys would go back to the neighborhood bar and discuss when they first noticed their penis was getting erect when they were with some girl. Those are the kind of things you didn't talk about. So a lot of this is difficult and people don't want to hear about sex. They particularly don't want to hear about sex between adults and children. They want to believe that it, these people are just disgusting, totally evil people. It makes it very hard to deal with, it makes it very hard for organizations to respond and understand. And I'm not against treatment. I believe that we have, a, have to have a diversity of, of responses. Some of them need life imprisonment. Some of them need 20 years, 10 years, five years. Some of them maybe need probation. Some of them need treatment. But I don't see treatment and punishment as being separate. You get punished for what you did. You get treatment to hope that it doesn't happen again because most of these people are not going to be locked up forever. Most of them are not going to be executed. So we have to start considering treatment. But what do you do when you're treating them? How do you isolate them from the community? How do you protect them? It would seem that the best way to deal with this, the most effective way to protect children is to educate them and give them the ability to protect themselves online and encourage an open dialogue between parents and children. So if there is grooming going on or if there is something that the child senses that's wrong that they at least alert the parents to, to what's happening. As a general rule of thumb I say things like beware of anyone who wants to be with your children more than you do. Beware of anyone who seems too good to be true. I'm not saying that makes him a pervert but you need to consider the possibility because you devote your life to children it would be a terrible thing to assume all those people have some sexual interest in children. But it also would be a terrible thing to assume that they don't because they're so good. Because they want to look at this problem as simplistically black and white and good and evil. They want all the offenders to be totally evil and they want all the victims to be little angels that God sent us from heaven. But that's not reality, especially when you start to deal with adolescent victims. You know, 20 years ago, you know, I had no idea that this predator investigation would turn into something that would be iconic, that would be 
something that I'd be engaged in 19 years later. I mean, you know, it's it's still 10% of my portfolio, but it is, you know, what has become the most iconic in pop culture of anything I've ever done. But, I mean, but the, thing that always, the thing that always amazed me is watching your shows is how calm, cool, and collected you remained when that guy walked into the room and looked you in the eye. You didn't get all, you know, pumped up and go ranting and raving and so on and so forth. Ken, thank you for doing it for 50 years. Thank you for sharing your insight with me and, and we'll keep this dialogue going and, and take care of yourself and we'll speak again soon. Okay, well, good luck to you. Thank you, sir. To watch more episodes, head over to watchtrueblue.com.